Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at monetary policy in Canada. So, so far, in order to have the, kind of the background that we need for this video, we've taken a look at money and the functions of money. We've really explained what is money and we've defined the money supply. We've taken a look at bonds, we've defined what are bonds, we've worked out how to price bonds, and importantly, we've taken a look at this whole inverse relationship between the price of a bond and that bond's yield to maturity, or the prevailing interest rate. Then from there, we've moved on and we've taken a look at the banking, right, the banking sector, the banking industry, we've taken a look at both private banks and central banks, and we've talked briefly about the functions and the roles of each one, and primarily in that there are the private banks, the depositors, the central banks, all of these different players, their roles in our money creation process. So with all that background now, we have what we need in order to look at monetary policy, and monetary policy is how governments, and in Canada, not necessarily the government, but a government agency, that is the Bank of Canada, how they can enact monetary policy in order to achieve their goals, in order to achieve their mandates. So, what are our goals for this video? Well, our objectives for this video are to, first of all, explain the policy goal of the Bank of Canada. That is, what is the Bank of Canada's mandate? in conducting monetary policy. What are they trying to achieve? Then we will move on and we will look at how the Bank of Canada conducts monetary policy. So what tools they have and how they go about it and how it ends up impacting our greater economy. We will then take a look at the short run versus the long run impacts of monetary policy on our economy. And then finally, we will discuss a little bit of costs versus benefits of having the central bank be independent from the government. So as we have here in the Bank of Canada, where the Bank of Canada is independent, they're not answerable in the day-to-day -to, -day to government, versus having a central bank that is managed, is controlled by the current sitting government. So four objectives for us to look at. Let's go, let's jump over and let's take a look at our first bit, which is exploring the mandate of the Bank of Canada. Okay, so one of the first things to help remind ourselves as we move into this is just, well, what is the mandate of the Bank of Canada? We're taking a look at monetary policy, and really it's okay, keep in mind, monetary policy, how the Bank of Canada is going to use money, money supply, money demand, all of that through our monetary transmission mechanism. We took a look at this a few videos ago. We'll come back, we'll go through it again. But through our monetary transmission mechanism, to influence our greater economy. And so we saw how that works through and then we said, okay, well, why? Why will the Bank of Canada engage in monetary policy? What are their goals or objectives? What is their purpose for engaging it? Well, Bank of Canada, they have a mandate and that mandate is to target Inflation, so that's the annual change in price level, they want to target inflation to be equal to 2%. Now, okay, there's some wiggle room allowed in this, right? 2% is a pretty, uh, pretty precise, pretty specific target. And so what we do is we target 2% plus or minus 1%, meaning that the Bank of Canada ideally will have inflation sitting between a minimum of 1% and a maximum of 3%. That's their kind of bounded range for inflation. Meaning that if they start to forecast inflation to be approaching the lower bound, well, then they're going to start to engage in monetary transmission, or sorry, into monetary policy through our monetary transmission mechanism in order to push up price levels. And again, we'll see how exactly they do that. If alternatively, inflation seems to be heating up and approaching the upper limit, of their target well then they're going to go the other way they're going to start to engage in some contractionary monetary policy in order to slow down monetary growth in order to slow down economic activity in order to bring us back down within our band so again just to start us off here really that the goal of the mandate of the bank of canada is to target inflation within this range now what we need to keep in mind is that this goal, this mandate of the Bank of Canada, 
often, well, not often, but rather it can come into conflict with the goals of the current sitting government, right? And keep in mind that the current sitting government, so current sitting government, this is either the liberals, the conservatives, or maybe the NDP, um, whatever is our current sitting government, our political kind of elected officials. Well, current sitting government, they, of course, they can exercise fiscal policy. So again, just to kind of break apart that distinction there, the Bank of Canada exercises monetary policy. And we'll see, right, we still have to see how they do that. But they exercise monetary policy in order to achieve inflation between one and three. Our current sitting government, if they want to get involved, they can engage in fiscal policy. That is, of course, changing government expenditure, changing tax rates. And typically, governments engage in fiscal policy in order to close output gaps. Sometimes to try to create an output gap, right? To try to create jobs, to create all these things and kind of push us maybe into an expansionary inflationary output gap so that, hey, we have good times. It could be the reason, right? Fiscal policy just has to be government's choice of government expenditure and taxation to achieve either political or economic goals. And that's really the big thing is that governments can use fiscal policy just to achieve political goals. It might just be that, hey, they've promised to lower the unemployment rate. So they're going to push up economic activity, right? Push up GDP just to cause the unemployment rate to go down. And that's maybe not economically sound. Maybe that's not economically ideal, but it's politically ideal for this political party. And so they've used fiscal policy for that purpose. Let's take a look at this scenario, though, and let's see how this scenario that I've just introduced here that, hey, maybe this uh, political party had a goal to drop unemployment rates. Maybe the government exercising this goal comes into conflict with the Bank of Canada's mandate and why the Bank of Canada may then need to use monetary policy in conflict to the fiscal policy. And we'll see some kind of potential tension that arises with that. So let's take a look at a brief example, walking, talking through that. And in order to do so, let's go back. It's been a few weeks since we've looked at this, but let's go back and let's take a look at our aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. So we have price level on our vertical. We have real GDP on our horizontal. Downward sloping, we're going to have our aggregate demand curve. Upward sloping, we're going to have our aggregate supply curve. Now, keep in mind, right, our aggregate supply curve technically has those three parts. We have that Keynesian zone, the intermediate zone, and the neoclassical zone. We, of course, are just going to kind of wave our hands, draw it as a straight line in order to be, right, just saying we're kind of zoomed in on that part of the curve that would be in our intermediate zone that's right intersecting with our aggregate demand. A way that we can kind of wave our hands rather than drawing our aggregate supply like that each time which just gets a little bit messy. Okay, in order for this to be a long run equilibrium, we also need our long run aggregate supply curve. So let's include that guy. Uh, let's use the right tool to make that look pretty. There we go. So we have our long run aggregate supply. This long run aggregate supply gives us our idea of potential GDP. That is the level of GDP we could produce if we were at full employment, all, all our, our factors of employment working. And again, that's not, sorry, not everybody working. That's rather the only unemployed factors we have are those which are naturally unemployed. So that is unemployed due to either structural or frictional reasons. So yielding our potential GDP. We also have our actual GDP. Actual GDP, which is actually observed, is determined where aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. So in this case here, that is also right at that same point. And so we start off in our long run equilibrium where potential GDP equals actual GDP. Aggregate demand equals aggregate supply also gives us our price level. And we can presume that we start off at a price level of 100. So Okay, we have our situation. We're presuming we're starting in this long run equilibrium. And let's suppose that the government, as we said, they have a political goal 
to lower unemployment rates. They want less unemployment. That is right. Hey, we're at potential GDP. That is right. Potential equals actual. This, this means that our natural rate of unemployment equals our actual rate of unemployment. So our only unemployment is due to structural or frictional reasons. But for some reason, we have a political rationale to say that, hey, this natural rate of unemployment is still too high. We want less unemployment. Right, and that's sometimes that's the case. There are some countries where it's uh, estimated that this natural rate of unemployment could be 10 to 14 percent. Right, that could be quite significant levels of natural unemployment. Um, there's other ways, other policy ways that we can go about solving this problem in order to encourage work. But let's suppose that the way that the government decides to lower this unemployment rate is through fiscal policy. And that is they realize that, hey, if we increase output, if we increase output, if we have more output, well, we need more people to make all that stuff. So, hey, if we use fiscal policy to push up output, we will similarly be pushing down the unemployment rate. So, OK, how do we do that? Well, fiscal policy to push up GDP can be done two ways. We could either increase our government expenditure. Keeping in mind government expenditure, that's part of our aggregate demand, right? This is our aggregate expenditure. So more government expenditure would be more aggregate expenditure. We could also cut our tax rates, right? By cutting that net tax rate, that is either by taxing people less or by giving them more subsidies. Either way, that's going to cut that net tax rate, leaving more money to be expended in that private sector by for consumption and on and on. So whichever way we cut that, or maybe both, is going to have the impact of, for a fixed price level, increasing our aggregate demand curve. So let's go and shift that to the right. And I'm just going to actually move this curve to the right. There we go. So we shift that curve to the right using our fiscal policy. And as we do so, we get our new short-run macroeconomic equilibrium. And that occurs where our aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. So that gives us our new y prime one. And then also we get our new higher price level. We're going to say this is something like, I'm just going to make up a number 101, right? Just the fact that, hey, we've increased prices, we've increased GDP. So, hey, by increasing GDP, by increasing output, we have dropped the unemployment rate. Well, the government successfully implemented this fiscal policy. But keep in mind what they've also done. They have also increased this price level. Increasing price level is putting positive pressure on inflation. This is now kind of triggering the mandate of the Bank of Canada. They're now going, oh, we're having inflationary pressures. This isn't good. We don't like inflationary pressures. We want inflation to be maintained at a rate that we can control. Uh, we're going to have to watch this. We're going to have to see what's going on. The issue with this even farther is that, okay, we've used fiscal policy. We've pushed ourselves into this expansionary output gap where our economy is now superheated. We now have our natural adjustment, right? This is, again, anytime we are out of our long-run equilibrium, our economy just through natural market forces is going to begin to have discrepancies, are going to be not having balance in this lack of balance starts to push us back towards balance, push us back towards equilibrium. And this whole natural adjustment process to remind ourselves goes like this. We have output greater than potential output, right? So that's the whole nature of our inflationary output gap. So output greater than potential means that our actual unemployment is less than our natural rate of unemployment. So we have a shortage of workers. If we have a shortage of workers, we right, we can't find the workers we need to produce the stuff we want to produce. How do we find these workers? Well, this low, low unemployment rate leading to our desperate look for workers causes us to push up wages. Right? So again, expansionary output gap causing low rates of unemployment low rates of unemployment leading to a shortage of workers, excess demand for workers, excess demand for workers starts to push up the price of workers. That is our wage rate. 
So, right, that order of events is pretty important there. It's not that, hey, the inflationary output gap causes wages to go up. Well, okay, it does, but not directly, right? This inflationary output gap causes low levels of unemployment, which causes excess demand for workers, which then causes wages to go up. So, right, in the storytelling, the steps are important in that. Okay, so where are we at? Wages are rising. Okay, what's the big deal with this? Well, as we allow wages to rise, rising wages increases our costs of production, meaning citrus paribus, all else constant, higher cost of production due to these higher factor prices, factor prices, means that we can't produce as much as we once were. That is, through this here, our aggregate supply curve begins to contract. So let's work through what that does. And again, I'm just going to move the curve itself. So our aggregate supply curve is going to begin to contract. That is, our aggregate supply curve is going to begin to go to the left due to these rising wages. And as our aggregate supply curve goes to the left, it creeps to the left, creeps to the left until we arrive back at our long-run equilibrium. And why is this our long-run equilibrium? Well, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, are equal right at our long run aggregate supply. That is at this point, if we take a look at that, break that down, right? We once again have potential equal to actual. So, hey, cool, government went engaged in fiscal policy. They temporarily were able to push down the unemployment rate. This maybe lasted for a few years. Wages began to rise. People are pretty happy about that. But through this whole process, output gradually just returned back to potential. Okay, so in the end, our output just returned back to where it was. Unemployment just returned back to where it was. Okay, no real win there in the end. In the long run, nothing really was impacted. But wait, what was the long run impact of this policy? Long run impact of this policy was another increase in the price level. So that is by the government trying to achieve this political goal, they've just created an artificial inflationary output gap, which has brought it back. And then really the big impact of this was increasing price levels, increasing price levels being increasing inflation, increasing inflation. This is raising concerns for our Bank of Canada. They may want to get involved depending on how much price levels are increasing, and they may actually get involved in such a way that it negates or rather comes into conflict with the political actions the fiscal policy being implemented by the current sitting government and so technically we can see these kind of conflicts arising between the two so the point of this really to show that monetary policy and fiscal policy are very different things fiscal policy is ideally done to achieve economic goals of closing output gaps but it can also be done to achieve political goals. Monetary policy, monetary policy is aimed at targeting price levels and through looking at rates of inflation, changes in our price level. And so we're looking at a very different thing. That is, if we were to simplify it, typically, this is where fiscal policy is concerned. Typically, fiscal policy is concerned with our horizontal axes, that is, with GDP. On the other side of it, monetary policy. Monetary policy is concerned with our vertical axes, that is our changes in price level. Are price levels increasing? Are they decreasing? So because of the way that these go, sometimes they come into conflict with each other. Quite often though, quite often government is able to coordinate between central banks and actual government in order to have both policies working together to achieve a common goal. But just in order to create that dichotomy, that separation between the two, that they are different policies aiming to achieve different means. Okay, that being said, let's carry on into our next part then. Let's go and take a look at how the Bank of Canada conducts monetary policy. All right, we've taken a look at this and said, hey, look, it's different, but you're like, but how do we do it? What, what is monetary policy? Come on, well, let's go take a look at that. Okay, so the thing to take a look at is that the Bank of Canada engages in monetary policy through a policy tool that we will call Open Market Operations. 
And these can be abbreviated to OMO, Open Market Operations. That is an E for operations. There we go. Now, what are open market operations? Open market operations are the Bank of Canada going to the going to the open market to buy or sell bonds. And they go to the open market to buy or sell bonds in order to influence the price of the bond, the interest rate of that bond, but more importantly, it ends up injecting or removing money through our whole money supply process. So let's take a look at this. Let's talk about this open market operation and kind of see how it works in this case. So let's take a look at our two players. We have for our two players our Bank of Canada. And right, we can draw a little picture here. Bank of Canada. Uh, I like to kind of think of government buildings as kind of this Roman Greek architecture. So there we go. We have kind of our Bank of Canada pillars. There we go. Okay. So Bank of Canada on one side. On the other side of this, we have our corporate banks. So again, our corporate banks, well, we're government buildings. In my mind, I tend to have them ingrained in this Greco-Roman architecture. I tend to think of a lot of corporate banks as kind of this more just big, blocky Soviet architecture, which is just big skyscrapers, concrete buildings with our windows. So there we go. That is our bank. And really what I mean by bank is I mean financial intermediary. These are our private banks. This is our central bank. Okay. What we have flowing between the two is we have money, right? These are the reserves flowing back and forth. And we have bonds, right? We have this buying and selling of bonds, which is right essentially a loan. We've seen that going through the bonds and how that works. Okay. Let's take a look at one of the two types of open, op open market operations that can take place. And that is the first one here being an open market sale. And that is what the Bank of Canada does. And what you have to keep in mind is that in the Bank of Canada's vaults, they are going to keep a whole bunch of government bonds and they're going to keep a whole bunch of money. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that these bonds and this money that, in, that is in the Bank of Canada's vault are not in circulation, so they are not part of the money supply. They are not part of the bonds in circulation either. They are locked away. They are kind of in this uh, monetary jail, as it were, right? You can think of the Bank of Canada as that, as a monetary jail. So if the Bank of Canada were to engage in an open market sale, they are going to sell bonds on the open market. So, okay, they're going to sell bonds. They're going to take some of these bonds and they're going to sell them. So these are bonds going that way. So, okay, Banking is selling the bonds. You and I and all of these people within the nation are buying these bonds. We don't know they're being sold by the Bank of Canada. They're just being sold. And right, we typically end up buying these through our bank. So we're just going to kind of simplify that step and just say that, hey, the bank is buying these bonds. These financial intermediaries are buying these bonds. Okay, keep in mind, if the financial intermediary or even if it was you or I are buying these bonds, in order to buy these bonds, we need to give them money, right? We're trading. We're buying a bond. We're giving money. Just like when we buy a cheeseburger, we give the money for the cheeseburger. Same kind of idea. So, okay, Bank of Canada is selling the bonds to us and we, or the financial institutions, financial intermediaries, are giving money to the Bank of Canada. So that is by engaging in this open market sale, what the Bank of Canada has just done is they've taken money out of circulation, away from the banks, away from the depositors, away from this money creation process. They have siphoned it out. And now they have it and they can put it in monetary jail. So this whole bit here of an open market sale has just decreased our money supply. It has decreased how much money is in circulation altogether. Okay, flip side of it, what's, what's the other possible way that we could do? Well, the other side of it is an open market purchase. 
And in the case of an open market purchase, we're going to have the opposite story. Let's just clean this guy up here a little bit first. There we go. So for an open market purchase, we're doing the other way. The Bank of Canada is going out to the open market and they're buying bonds, right? They're buying bonds from you and I and from the financial institutions that are holding bonds. They're going out and they're just buying these off the open market. So that is our bonds, right? We can say simplified and just say that, hey, it's the financial institutions that hold all the bonds. They're selling them to the Bank of Canada. So in this case here, the bonds are going to the Bank of Canada and they're going in away. They're going away out of circulation altogether. Now, okay, as they've sold the bonds to the Bank of Canada, they're expecting something in return. And that thing they're expecting in return is they're expecting to be paid for those bonds they just sold. They're expecting to receive money. So in this case here, the Bank of Canada, right, open market sale, the Bank of Canada sold bonds. In this case here, open market purchase, the Bank of Canada buys bonds on the open market. By buying bonds, they give money, they inject money into circulation, right? Now these are depositors that just sold their bonds and now they sold their bonds, they have a whole bunch of money. This money that they have, they now put on deposit. Alternatively, these were a bunch of bonds that banks held. As banks held these bonds, they've sold them. They now have this that they can put in their reserves and they're like, okay, we have these excess reserves. All of this ultimately ends up increasing our money supply. So open market sale, selling bonds, taking money out of circulation, decreasing money supply, open market purchase, buying bonds on the open market, giving money to the financial institutions, financial intermediaries, increasing the money supply. So two different sides of this, two different sides of this. Now, okay, we've seen then that through this, we have our liquidity preference framework. But let's remind ourselves what this liquidity preference framework is. So our liquidity preference framework looks something like this. We had our interest rate, we had our quantity of money, and we then had our money demand curve. And we had as a vertical line, our money supply curve. Okay. Where these two intersected, we obtained, of course, the quantity of money in circulation, and we obtained what the corresponding interest rate was. And truthfully here, this, this interest rate that we determined in this liquidity preference, this is our risk-free interest rate. This is the risk-free interest rate, the lowest risk interest rate that could, that could exist in the economy. And what we're gonna do, in previous videos, we kind of held up that, hey, a 30-day T-bill was kind of the notion of this risk-free interest rate. We're actually going to introduce another interest rate that's even less risky than a 30-day T-bill, right? Even less risky than a 30-day loan from the government. So we'll talk about that shortly. But essentially, that's what this is, is that risk-free interest rate. Okay, so right now we have equilibrium. We have equilibrium, and let's say that the, let's, let's scroll down, and uh, let's kind of keep our picture up there on the top. Let's keep that picture so we can see it. Okay, so let's suppose that the Bank of Canada, Bank of Canada, decides to, uh, that's a two, engage in an open market uh, let's say they decide to engage in an open market purchase, just because we just went through that one. Let's kind of take a look at what's happening in this case. Well, okay, what's happening? Our financial intermediaries, they are selling bonds to the Bank of Canada. As these financial intermediaries are selling their bonds to the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Canada is giving these financial intermediaries money, right? This money that they're giving them, these financial intermediaries, financial intermediaries, they are then going liabilities, assets, deposits. We're going to have reserves and loans. Keep in mind, hey, a bond is a debt instrument, right? A bond is a debt instrument. A bond is just a loan. 
So, hey, by selling these bonds, essentially what they've done is they've gotten rid of some of these loans. And as a result, they have increased their reserves. They have sold these bonds, sold these loans to the Bank of Canada. And as a result, the Bank of Canada has given them money, which is an increase in reserves. Okay. This increase in reserves, hey, reserves plus cash altogether. Keep in mind that is our monetary base, also known kind of as our high powered money. And then we worked out from that, right? This is all previous videos. If this is all completely brand new to you, go back and take a look at these previous videos. It's pretty important stuff for our money creation process is we could work out that, hey, our money supply was equal to our monetary base times our money multiplier, one plus our currency ratio all over our target reserve ratio plus our currency ratio. So a little small there, I know. I'm sorry. Hopefully you can get that full screen and still see it okay. Okay, so what's happened in this case? Well, right, we've already talked through, okay, open market purchase increases money supply. We want to take a look at the mechanics, the why, the how as to where this happens. So this money in increased our reserves. We already talked about that. As reserves increase, all else constant, our monetary base increases, all else constant. As our monetary base increases, well, our monetary base increasing is going to get multiplied and then is going to increase our money supply. So, okay, as that goes on, what exactly does that have as an effect? Well, that's our money supply increasing. As our money supply increases, Let's take a look at what happens here. Money supply increases. We have initially this discrepancy between money demand and money supply being, hey, right now we have a money demand as such. We have a money supply as such, meaning that, hey, we have a lot more money available to us than we know what to do with. What do we do with all this extra money? Well, we begin to buy bonds from each other. As we begin to buy bonds, and there's fewer bonds altogether available for us to buy, we begin to push up the price of the bonds. As we push up that price of the bond, we begin to push down the interest rate. As we push down the interest rate, we arrive at this new, at this new equilibrium with a new lower interest rate, I prime, and our new quantity up money. So we've seen, okay, the Bank of Canada was just able to use an open market purchase to push up our money supply. By pushing up the money supply, they're able to push down the interest rate. And why would they want to do all this? What, what is the end objective? What is happening in this? Well, okay, we can now talk about our monetary transmission mechanism. Let's talk about that. We kind of alluded to this at the start. Let's bring it back up. Monetary transmission mechanism and in this monetary transmission mechanism it is how changes in this liquidity preference framework how changes in our money supply and interest rate filter through to affect our macro economy that is how do they filter through to affect our aggregate demand aggregate supply and okay so how is that in this case here money supply increased shifted to the right as a result of that, our interest rate fell. Okay, direct result of falling interest rate, nominal interest rate, that affects our real consumption. So lower interest rate means higher levels of real consumption. Either two ways to think of this, we're less enticed to save. Lower nominal interest rate, we're not getting a great return on our savings. It's either eat it today or eat it tomorrow. Uh, if I save it, I don't get to eat that much more tomorrow, so I'm just going to eat it today instead. Alternatively, low interest rates, it's really cheap to get a loan. So, hey, really cheap to finance my present consumption. So low interest rates, consumption up. Going along the idea of right our neo-Keynesian view of sticky prices, prices don't respond right away. So this change in the nominal interest rate is also going to result in a change in the real interest rate. A change in the real interest rate is going to influence our real investment. 
Now, okay, real investment, same kind of idea. If our real interest rate is low, it's really cheap to finance our new investment projects, our new factories, capital purchases, etc. So as the real interest rate drops, uh, it's pretty cheap to build that new factory on loan. So my real investment is going to increase. Okay, what else is happening? We also have the impact of these changes in our interest rates on our capital flows. Okay, so all of our international savers who are like, well, I could buy a Canadian bond, I could buy a US bond, I could buy a European bond, yada, 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 yada. Initially, in equilibrium, they look at all of these bonds and they say, yeah, you know what, the risk weighted returns on all of them are identical. I'm indifferent between, say, a Canadian and a U.S. bond. Okay, that was before. Now the interest rate has fallen. So the yield to maturity on a Canadian bond has gone down. That is, interest rate on a Canadian bond down. That means as the interest rate has gone down, that is, the price of them has gone up. Canadian bonds look relatively expensive now compared to all the other foreign bonds. They're also earning this lower yield to maturity. For all of the in international savers who were previously holding them, well, they just got a bunch of capital gains as the price of those bonds they were holding went up. But now they're looking at it and they're going, yeah, Canada's a low interest rate environment. All else equal, my money could be better off in the US, could be better off in Europe, could be better off in other places. So all these international savers, they begin to sell Canadian bonds, or to put it the other way, right, there's just not as much demand to buy Canadian bonds. Altogether, either way you want to think of this, either the all these international people are selling Canadian bonds, there's not as many international savers buying Canadian bonds, is that this means that there is less demand for Canadian dollars. Or as they're selling Canadian bonds, they're also selling Canadian dollars to be able to switch those dollars into the currency that they want in order to buy the bonds that they want. So less demand for Canadian dollars, everybody's selling Canadian dollars, that causes the Canadian dollar to depreciate. That is, the Canadian dollar becomes, it starts to become worth less and less and less in relation to other foreign currencies. What does that mean? If the Canadian dollar is becoming to be worth less and less and less, that means that Canadian goods look relatively cheap. If Canadian goods look relatively cheap, well, then foreigners want to buy Canadian goods, so our exports begin to rise. At the same time, at the same time, right, exports begin to rise because, hey, our stuff looks cheap. Foreign stuff to us looks really expensive, so our imports begin to fall. Okay, so monetary transmission mechanism. This change in interest rates has influenced consumption, investment, exports, imports. All together, all of these things, we have a change in our planned aggregate expenditure. Going to our Keynesian cross, right? A change in our planned aggregate expenditure. All of this, uh, let's see, let's go highlight this guy in red. This guy, this guy, this guy, that was all an increase in autonomous expenditure. This guy dropping imports, dropping our marginal propensity to import, that is an increase in our marginal propensity to spend domestically. Altogether, all of this, both of these guys in conjunction, causes real GDP for a fixed price level to increase. If real GDP for a fixed price level is increasing, well, that means in our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, that our aggregate demand curve is shifting to the right. So our monetary transmission mechanism in action. And what have we just seen, right? What have we just seen? What started all this? The Bank of Canada decides to engage in an open market purchase. That open market purchase, increasing our aggregate demand, Pushing our aggregate demand curve to the right. Okay, so that's our idea. That is our idea for our monetary policy, is that the Bank of Canada can engage in these open market purchases 
By engaging in these open market purchases, they can manipulate our money supply. As the money supply is manipulated, the interest rates manipulated. As the interest rates manipulated, all of these factors get manipulated, which then manipulates our aggregate demand curve. Great. Awesome. Problems. Okay. Our first problem was kind of highlighted in our last video when we were talking about private banking and this whole money creation process and our players in this money creation process. And that is the Bank of Canada through their open market operations. All the Bank of Canada is able to influence is the monetary base. And now mind you, if everything else in the world is constant, a change in the monetary base is just going to be multiplied up to cause a greater change in the money supply. And yeah, that's, that's great. That's easy. But as we saw at the end of that video, we took a look at an example where, hey, the central bank, in that case there, we took a look at the U.S. Fed, so the U.S. central bank, wanted to increase the monetary base, just like we've done here. But at the same time, our private banks decided they were really scared and they wanted to increase their reserve ratios. They were worried about liquidity. So as the, as the central bank, as the U.S. Fed pushed up their monetary base, our private banks, instead of taking this money on reserve and then lending it out and creating our multiplier effect, this private banks just kind of took this money on reserve and said, thanks, we're worried about liquidity. We're just going to increase our target reserve ratios. And they just ate and they just held on to that money and they didn't circulate it, they didn't increase it. As a result of that, well, keep in mind, right? Keep in mind, money supply increased, but the big factor that actually caused things to change was these changes in interest rates, right? It was actually the interest rate that then fueled everything else. The interest rate was then fueled by money supply. So that is, hey, if we needed the interest rate to change all the way down to I prime to get the goal, the outcome that we needed, but due to banks holding on to all of the reserves we just gave them, money supply hardly changes. If money supply hardly changes, right, let's just quickly see what this change would have been. Interest rate hardly falls. So because the banks are just holding on to all of this money that we just gave them, they're not lending it out, they're not creating new money. So because of this, our money supply barely changes. Because our money supply barely changes, our interest rate barely changes. If our interest rate barely changes, then there's not going to be much change in consumption, investment, exchange rates, capital flows, net exports, and aggregate demand. Meaning that Ah, if we're just trying to target a change in our money supply, if we're just trying to deal with moving this guy around, we're going to run into problems. And those problems we're going to run into is that we cannot control what private banks hold as their reserve ratios. They might just hold on to everything. Or, hey, we might hope they're keeping it constant, but they drop their liquidity concerns and they actually expand the money supply more than we hoped. That creates a problem too. We also can't, and we talked about this in the last video as well, we also can't control these currency ratios. And as depositors change the amount of money they want to hold as cash, that again is going to have quite a drastic influence on our money supply. So really what we're getting at in this is that the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Canada can use these open market operations to move our money supply around in order to obtain an interest rate, but it becomes extremely difficult. It becomes extremely difficult because they can't really ever determine how powerful any one open market operation will be and what its effect is going to be on this money supply. It's a huge problem. That's a huge problem in engaging monetary policy. So how do we overcome this? How do we overcome this problem? And let's take a look at that. The way we overcome this problem is that the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Canada just does not target the money supply. 
In fact, the Bank of Canada says the money supply can be whatever the money supply needs to be. We will let the money supply float. So we will let the money supply float. Instead, we will, and I mean we as in the Bank of Canada, will target an interest rate. Right? And why would we want to target an interest rate? Well, because as we saw, it's not the money supply that causes a change in the aggregate demand, a change in our real economy. It is the interest rate that causes a change in our real economy. So instead of targeting, instead of trying to move money supply around, we're just going to skip that step altogether. And we're just going to go straight to the fuel of the thing. And that is we're going to go straight to this interest rate. So how does this work? How does this work? Well, to start off, let's take a look at it through our monetary, uh, sorry, our liquidity preference framework to start off. I was going to say monetary transmission mechanism. Yes, it gets there, but through our, this liquidity preference framework. Okay. So we have our money demand and we have our money supply. There we go. And we have, based off of this initial situation, we have our current interest rate. So there we go, interest rate. I'm going to go interest rate, not for our initial interest rate. Now, let's suppose that the Bank of Canada, just like we saw here, wants to get the interest rate to fall. And to get the interest rate to fall, they're going to go through all of this because ultimately their goal is to get the aggregate demand curve to increase. So how are they going to do that? Well, what they're going to do is they're going to announce a new interest rate. We'll call it I1. They're going to announce this new interest rate, this new lower interest rate, and they're going to say this is the new prevailing interest rate. And you look at this and it's you look at it and you're kind of like, okay, cool Bank of Canada. You can say that all you want, but hey, that's our money demand. That's our money supply. Market forces are saying, I have more need for money at this interest rate, right? I have more transactional demand, speculative demand, precautionary demand than I actually have physical money. The only way that I can satisfy all of this excess demand, right? So money demand greater than money supply. The only way I get this money that I need is by selling my bonds, to get money, right? And this is us. This is you and I. These are the financial institutions selling bonds in order to get access to that money that they're demanding. Well, as they sell bonds, no one's buying bonds. If no one's buying bonds, they begin to sell them for lower and lower prices. As they begin to sell them for lower and lower prices, the interest rate begins to get pushed back up and we just return back to equilibrium. So way to go, Bank of Canada. You just announced a new lower interest rate, but the market forces just pushed us back to where we were. Okay, this is where the Bank of Canada now gets involved. We have this excess demand for money, right? We have this excess demand for money and all these financial institutions, yeah, they're trying to sell bonds. And if the Bank of Canada did nothing, this is what the result would be, right? We would have these limited amount of bonds in circulation. Everybody's trying to sell, nobody's buying, so prices would fall. But let's see what happens if the Bank of Canada gets involved. Financial institutions are selling bonds. So on whole, everyone in our market is selling bonds. The Bank of Canada is going to come along and they're going to engage in their open market operations. Specifically, they're going to engage in open market purchases. Financial institutions, everybody in our economy is trying to sell bonds. So the Bank of Canada comes in and says, hey, hey, yeah, yeah. We will buy bonds. We will buy bonds from you. So, okay, hey, they're willing to buy bonds and they're not willing to buy bonds at a discounted price. They're willing to buy bonds at the price that they were initially asking for. So we're not actually changing our prices. We're not putting downward pressure on prices. We're just maintaining our prices. As this goes through, 
we are starting to right open market purchase we have our bank of canada over here we have our financial intermediaries over here they are selling those bonds and they are receiving money this money here that money that's an increase in our monetary base that's right increase in reserves in those financial intermediaries this increase in monetary base translates into an increase in money supply and all that the bank of canada says is hey we're going to keep engaging in open market purchases or just open market operations in general for as long as we need in order to enforce this new interest rate Right? So in that way, they're, they're not targeting a money supply. They're not saying, okay, we're only going to buy 5 million worth of bonds. No, 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 no. The Bank of Canada says we will keep purchasing bonds on the open market. We will keep purchasing them for as long as we need in order to get this money supply curve to float to this point here. And if something happens and it floats beyond that point, well, then the Bank of Canada will just flip around. And they'll start engaging in an open market sale in order to get the money supply to float back. And so what we have is through our monetary policy at the Bank of Canada, we just engage in interest rate targeting. We say this is the interest rate we want. And we will just engage in open market operations, either purchases or sale to allow this money supply curve to float in order for it to be maintained at our equilibrium interest rate. In this way here, we can bypass this whole problem of figuring out where our money supply curve is. We can bypass all of this. We can just set an interest rate and engage in open market operations in order to achieve that goal. In order just to allow the amount of money in circulation to be whatever it needs to be at our targeted interest rate. So that's our idea. That's our idea of allowing the money supply to float. That's the idea of how we engage in interest rate targeting. Now, okay, what I had said is this interest rate, this is our risk-free interest rate. And I even alluded to the fact that, hey, we actually have a risk-free interest rate that's even less risky, uh, more riskless, is that a word? More riskless than our 90-day government T-bill. And what exactly is going to be that even more risk-free rate that ultimately is going to be the rate that the Bank of Canada targets? Well, let's take a look. What we have to keep in mind is that one of the Bank of Canada's, one of their functions is to act as this lender of last resort. That is, they act as this lender of last resort, as this banker to the banks and let's talk about our whole fractional reserve banking system and everything that goes on with that for a second let's take a look right here in canada we have all of our big six banks we have td rbc bank of nova scotia uh what else do we have we have cibc uh, i'm missing two of them we have national bank and the bank of montreal bmo Okay, so we have these big six banks, and yes, we have many, many more banks at the whole and credit unions and case de populaires and treasury branches, etc., all across the nation. But these big six, they really account for about, now if I recall, it's about 92% of all assets under administration. So that is really, we don't lose much detail by just focusing on these big six. This is 92% of the banking that takes place in Canada is with these big six. That is, all of those other credit unions, case to popular treasury branches, all of them are fighting over that other 8% that exists. It's tiny in comparison. So, okay, let's focus on these guys. And they all deal with a fractional reserve system. So, right, again, to keep in mind what that is, is they have their vault. They have their vault where they keep their reserves. Okay, now in that... They have day to day, they have their deposits coming in, and they have their withdrawals coming out. Typically, 
these deposits coming in more or less match those withdrawals coming out, but never perfectly. That is at the end of a day, at the end of a day, let's say that TD ends up having excess deposits. So, okay, if they have excess deposits over withdrawals, more deposits coming in than withdrawals coming out, that is, their actual reserve ratio is going to be greater than their target reserve ratio. That is, they just have these excess reserves sitting in their vault overnight. And they're like, okay, I have this excess reserve sitting there. What, what should I do with it? Well, on the flip side, RBC, as they go through their whole thing, let's say that they had actually more withdrawals than deposits. So for RBC... The amount that they actually have in their vault is less than what they would like to, right? They have less reserves on hand than they ideally should have. So, okay, we have this issue here. We have TD, which has excess reserves. We have RBC, which is short. And hey, we kind of have a situation kind of built up here that we could have gains from trade. We could have TD give a loan to RBC just until everything's balanced out, right? Until RBC gets a few more deposits. So kind of overnight, this whole short-term intraday loan, we could have TD lend money, lend money to RBC. And as a result, they would get a small interest payment, right? Because, hey, it's two really big stable banks and they're giving out this loan literally on an overnight basis intraday it's only it's extremely short-term loan so okay not very much risk of default risk um right very unlikely rbc is going to default between today and tomorrow it's very short term so there's next to no inflation risk and we're all dealing in canadian dollars so there's no exchange rate risk we are really dealing with almost as riskless as we can get in this case here so Okay, at the end of every day, we have this whole intraday lending between all of our big financial intermediaries in order to kind of balance everything out and all the excess reserves get lent out to everybody with short reserves and the banks are able to make money because of this. This is great. But this is where the Bank of Canada steps in. The Bank of Canada, they can be viewed as this lender of last resort. That is any of these chartered banks any of them could, instead of dealing with each other to clear up this balance, they could deal with the Bank of Canada because the Bank of Canada is the banker to the banks. TD could take their excess reserves and they could put it on deposit at the Bank of Canada. And just like how you get an interest rate off your savings account, off your deposits, the Bank of Canada would pay TD a marginal low interest rate if TD put their money on deposit there. At the same time, RBC could borrow the money it needs from the Bank of Canada and obtain a loan from the Bank of Canada and pay an interest rate for that loan. So of course, the Bank of Canada always is there as this banker to the banks, but the Bank of Canada doesn't want to be, right? The Bank of Canada does not want to get engaged in this situation, does not want to have to get engaged. And so what they do is they set this up in a way that it's more beneficial for all of these banks to deal with each other and that the Bank of Canada is just there as a last resort. So how exactly does this work out? Well, the way that this works out is that the Bank of Canada, they go and they set their interest rate for this overnight lending. So interest rate, overnight rate, OR, overnight rate. For this interest rate, for the overnight rate, they then go and they set three rates on this. They set, first of all, their target rate. So interest rate, TR, this is their target overnight rate. And we'll just go and we'll put just a line across at that. And we'll say right now, this is about zero. 0.25. Keep in mind that this is actually this current target rate sent by the Bank of Canada that I have put in there at 0.25. This here is an emergency rate. 
This is an emergency short-term kind of rate, extremely low interest rate that was set because we're engaging this massive amount of monetary policy as we attempt to help the economy out of this pandemic. So this year, quarter of a percent, this is an extremely low target rate. Outside of this though, the Bank of Canada also has two other rates. They have on, let's go, we'll put this up in red. We have up here, we have our interest rate BR. I will call that the bank rate. So, okay, let's, let's, uh, this one here that we have here, this is our target rate. That guy, that guy's our bank rate. And what this amount here is, this is the amount that the Bank of Canada would lend, right? If the Bank of Canada, if RBC needed that loan, this is the rate that the Bank of Canada would lend money to the banks at. So that's our bank rate. And in this, there's a kind of a set margin between this. So they'll set a target rate at, in this case here, 0.25%. The difference, the difference between this target rate and our bank rate is going to be 25 basis points. And okay, 25 basis points, that is going to be 0.25 of a percent, right? So a single basis point is 0.01 of a percent. So, hey, if our target rate is 25 basis points, our bank rate then would be 0.50%. So, a little bit more above our target rate. Additionally, though, what we're going to have, and this one here, I've actually never found an actual name for this guy, but I end up calling it, as a result, is the interest rate. This is our deposit rate. And again, I don't know, I've never actually seen an actual name for this lower bound, but this lower bound, this is our deposit rate. And this deposit rate, this would be if TD didn't want to give that money to RBC, didn't want to lend that money to RBC, but instead just kind of wanted to put it on account at the Bank of Canada, deposit it at the Bank of Canada, they would earn this deposit rate on the loan, or on that deposit, I guess. And in this case here, again, this deposit rate has a separation from the target rate. Again, this is a fixed separation, a constant kind of rate between these two of again, 25 basis points or 0.25 of a percent. So that is in this case here, our target rate's already at 25.25%. So that is 25 basis points less. That is currently our deposit rate at the Bank of Canada is 0%. That is, if TD did decide to put that money with the Bank of Canada overnight, they actually wouldn't be earning anything on it. It would be just, yeah, sure, you can put it there, but you're not going to get anything. Okay. In this way, then, between this bank rate, the target rate, and the deposit rate, what the Bank of Canada is really doing is they are encouraging TD and RBC, and again, I'm just picking these two because they were the ones on the top here. They're picking the, they're really encouraging these two to deal with each other rather than deal with the Bank of Canada, right? And that is, we have lots of room for gains of trade here. TD is like, I could give it to the Bank of Canada and get zero. RBC could borrow from the Bank of Canada and pay 0.5 of a percent. Hey, TD could do better by charging RBC any amount less than 0.5 for the loan, and RBC could do better by accepting a loan at any rate le less than, right, lower than 0.5%. As a result, what we typically find is that these banks do just deal with each other on an overnight basis to clear up these funds, and they typically end up dealing with each other pretty close to this target rate, right? So they will end up just borrowing and lending money to each other close to this target rate, and by changing this target rate, by changing really what they want to have this overnight rate to be, Bank of Canada could push up, our overnight interest rate 
And by pushing up the overnight interest rate, what they essentially do is they move this entire bound, this entire deposit rate to bank rate, this entire area upwards. And by pushing that up, so interest rate, target rate up, that pushes up our risk-free rate. By pushing up our risk-free rate, well, that pushes up every interest rate in the economy. Because keep in mind, right, as we kind of saw back in our bond pricing, every interest rate is going to be made up of our risk, um, sorry, our risk-free rate plus a risk premium. And if this here is really our shortest risk-freest form of debt, that is going to be our, our risk-free interest rate. And any change in that will then quickly, quickly cascade through the entire economy. And in fact, we notice Bank of Canada has its eight announcements a year where it announces changes in interest rate or potential changes in interest rate within hours, if not minutes of their announcement, interest rates have adjusted throughout the economy up or down accordingly. So very, very rapid cascade of this through our overall economy. But, okay, how exactly do they enforce this? Like, if banks are dealing with each other at that, where, where, do, they, where do we end up at this new point, right? How do we enforce this? How do we get this to happen? How does this kind of form the foundation of our monetary policy? So in order to be able to explain this, what we need to go is we need to go take a look at a market for settlement balances. And this market for settlement balances builds off of what we were just looking at here. This, this graph, right? Kind of a graph. This visual. We'll actually turn this visualization into a graph, into a, of course, it's economics, a supply and demand diagram. And we'll utilize that to kind of demonstrate how the Bank of Canada uses open market operations, how the Bank of Canada uses this overnight interest rate, and then we'll wrap all of this together to see how this overnight interest rate through open market operations affects our monetary transmission mechanism to achieve the Bank of Canada's goal or mandate. So let's jump over, let's go take a look at that. Okay, so what we need to evaluate is this whole market for settlement balances. And this market for settlement balances is going to be, well, we're going to have our vertical, a horizontal interest rate, sorry, not interest rate, our vertical axis is going to be an interest rate. That's going to be our overnight rate. The horizontal axis, this is going to be our quantity of reserves. So how much reserves are held all together in this, in this economy on whole? We're then going to have, as we... As we kind of already put together, we're going to have our uh, target rate. Now let's kind of do that a bit lower. Let's make that line a little bit less uh, intrusive as well. We'll make it yellow maybe. There we go. So this will be our target rate. We'll have 25 basis points higher. We'll have our bank rate. So, right, keep in mind this bank rate, this is the rate in which banks could borrow from the Bank of Canada at, at this constant rate that's always available to them. And then we have at the bottom here, let's try to maintain the same kind of gap because it's, again, 25 basis points all the way along. Uh, maybe that's a bit big. Let's, let's move that up a bit. There we go. Something like that. This is our deposit rate, the rate at which we could deposit funds at the Bank of Canada. Initially, if the interest rate is really, really high, if the interest rate is really high, keeping in mind for my reserves or my balance sheet on hold for a bank, let's just take a look at this again, just remind ourselves, we have assets, liabilities, we have our deposits, we have our reserves, and we have our loans. Okay. The bank, the financial institutions, our financial intermediaries being profit maximizing institutions, they want to make profit and they make profit. They make their money off of loans. So ideally, they want more money in loans because more money in loans means they make more revenue. Now, they still need to hold money in reserve 
and they hold money in reserve for their liquidity requirements. So that, hey, if a big withdrawal happens out of the blue, they can satisfy that withdrawal from their reserves. Keep in mind, for every dollar held in reserve, that's a dollar they can't lend out. That is lost income. That's lost revenue. That's lost interest income. So what we see for this demand for reserves is that if the interest rate was really, really high, we're not going to have very much demand for reserves. At a really high interest rate, we could be getting lots of revenue by lending out that money. So at a high interest rate, we're going to want to hold as few reserves as we can. As the interest rate drops, well, so does the opportunity cost of holding reserves. So as the interest rate drops, the amount of reserves we're willing to hold increases. And what we end up getting is a downward sloping line. Let's make that line a bit bigger there, a bit more bold. And what we will tend to do is people go all the way down like our typical demand. Don't do that. This here actually is only going to go to this deposit rate, right? And why, why is that the case? Well, because this deposit rate is the lower bound of our possible overnight interest rates. You would never, ever have reserves earning an interest rate less than this deposit rate, right? Any reserves you have, you could either lend to another institution or you could put on deposit at the Bank of Canada and get this deposit rate for. You would never get a rate less than that. So our, de our demand for reserves goes down to our deposit rate and then it just kinks and it just goes as such. So there we go. We have our demand for reserves and I'll go demand. So that's our demand for these settlement balances. On the other side, we're going to have our supply of settlement balances. And this is going to be how much reserves are out there in circulation on whole. And in this case here, this is actually initially just going to be independent of the interest rate, right? This is just going to be how much we have in reserve. And our reserve is just going to be based off of our monetary base. And thus, this is just actually going to be fixed. So it's just going to be a line. But again, it's not going to go all the way up. It's actually going to stop right at this bank rate. And that's because at this bank rate, if I needed more reserves, right, there's actually an infinite supply of reserves available. I could always borrow these reserves from the Bank of Canada at the bank rate. So that is, as the interest rate goes higher and higher and higher, initially it has no impact on my reserves at all until this point. And then at that point there, my supply of reserves just shoots off towards infinite reserves, essentially. Because essentially, if the interest rate ever exceeds the bank rate, I would just start to borrow reserves from the Bank of Canada. I would just say, thanks, Bank of Canada. I have an interest rate higher than that. I'm just going to go whoop and start borrowing money from you because I need these reserves. So borrowed reserves past that point so kind of our typical supply and demand diagram but it's a little bit different right we have these kinks going on here we have these kinks but what we witness is the way that we've drawn this at least is that we actually have initial equilibrium right there at our interest rate that's at our target rate so hey we're happy we're good everything's okay for this okay how does the Bank of Canada maintain this? How does the Bank of Canada maintain kind of the amount of reserves being held, right? This is going to be our Q prime at this point. Well, again, they maintain this through our open market operations. And let's take a look at a scenario first as to how they could, how they could make sure this actually happens. And let's suppose that some event is happening such that maybe banks are getting a little bit worried about their reserves. They are worried about maybe the liquidity. And so our demand for reserves begins to creep up. So, okay, as our demand for reserves begins to creep up, that ends up doing something like this. And the impact that that has, right, this is, this is where the Bank of Canada is going to be interested in it, 
is that it begins to push up this rate at which they borrow and lend to each other on this overnight basis. They're pushing up this overnight rate beyond the target rate, right? This year's starting to push up towards our bank rate. Keep in mind, the Bank of Canada does not actually want to be a lender of last resort. The Bank of Canada doesn't actually want to be lending reserves to people. So what the Bank of Canada can do in this case in order to offset this, in order to put a downward pressure on this interest rate is they can start to get involved and they can engage in, we want to push down the interest rate. So again, if we want to push down the interest rate, we want to inject money into this system. Um, right. Let, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. Push down the interest rate, injecting money to do so, right? We increased our money supply in that case there. So that was going to be this whole open market purchase. By purchasing bonds, the financial institutions are selling their bonds and they're receiving money. That is, hey, they had their excess demand for reserves. This excess demand for reserves is what was pushing up our interest rate. Well, instead of just being stuck with that, the Bank of Canada will say, okay, hey, you guys are stuck with this fixed amount of reserves, so this increased demand for reserves due to liquidity concerns is pushing up the interest rate. How about we step in? Instead of you guys buying all of this from each other, how about we engage in an open market purchase? Through this open market purchase, right? This is, again, just strictly so that our money supply can float. Through this open market purchase, we will buy some of your bonds. So essentially that's buying some of your loans and we will give you money, which is essentially going to be money into your reserves. So, okay, that is, we are decreasing the amount of loans we have. We are increasing the amount of reserves we have. And as we do that, well, all of this, increasing the amount of reserves. This is increasing the amount of reserves in circulation on hold given this open market purchase. It is increasing altogether our supply of reserves. And again, this will continue to happen. We'll continue to engage in this open market purchase until, right, this is going to get pretty messy, so I'm just going to move this line here. Open market purchase, increasing our supply of reserves until we wind up right back, right there, at a supply and demand of reserves at our target ratio. So again, what we can do is we can engage, right? Same idea as our whole liquidity preference framework. We can target an interest rate. By targeting this interest rate, we're still gonna have our natural forces of supply and demand, which are going to put pressure either to increase, or of course, we have the opposite, decrease that interest rate. If we respond to these market forces by using open market operations, we can resultingly increase our supply. By increasing our supply, we can then return back to that interest rate which we have targeted. And that's our big idea of monetary policy, is to always pick an interest rate to target and then to engage in policy to reinforce that target. To say, hey, you need more money, we will keep giving you money as long as that interest rate's maintained. You feel you have too much money, we will buy that money from you. We will give you bonds for that money in order to maintain that interest rate. Always money supply floating in order to keep an interest rate stable at the targeted rate. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of in-depth details as to interest rate targeting and all of that. We have the mechanics kind of underneath our belt now. We have an idea how to do this. Let's take a look at our actual monetary transmission mechanism. Let's take a look at our actual application of monetary policy. So that wraps us up for this first little bit of just taking a look at our tools of monetary policy. Uh, what we're gonna do next, we're gonna jump over to another video to actually take a look at how we enact monetary policy. 
But for now, if you have any questions on anything that we've covered, so that is kind of this mandate of the Bank of Canada, this market for settlement balances, this overnight interest rate, this use of targeting interest rates rather than targeting money supply, the fact that the Bank of Canada just allows this money supply to float, use of open market operations, open market sales versus open market purchases. If any of that is unclear, if you're unsure about it, well, yes, we'll be going through it farther. We'll be going through it in more detail in the next video. But of course, feel free to comment below. Of course, feel free to post in our D2L Frequently Asked Questions. And feel free to send me an email with any questions you may have as well. Till next time.